Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. One of the biggest things that we kind of, like I like to pitch is education through competition. So we want to make sure that when we're doing these type of competitions, again, we're trying to educate people, use the right gear mm -hmm. for the right you know, opportunity or the right hunt that you're going to go on. As long as we keep it simple for people, yeah. it's really not hard to learn. And then the excitement that they get when you can show them, you know, five or 600 yard target yeah. and they're able to make first round impacts. Yeah, I mean, that excitement it's on their face. It is. It's life changing. You know, I would much rather teach somebody what they can do at 500 yards so that when they're at 200 yards, they have 100% confidence. Mm -hmm. We talk about precision rifle or shooting as a perishable skill, but hunting's a perishable skill. 100%. Right? I mean, if you don't know, if you can't remember how to spot, if you can't remember how to track, if you can't remember, you know, how to shoot, yeah, I mean, the, even the simplest things, if you don't remember what that knot was to tie up your tent, yeah. things get bad and frustrating kind of quick, oh, right? Oh, for sure. So, we want people that are going to be hunting for the first time or their hundredth time yeah. to practice these skills during the off season so that they are more successful during when they're the out. Season. Right. Mm -hmm. Today we're gonna to be talking about the Ruger Security 9 pistol. It's ideal for everyday carry and self-defense. The Ruger Security 9 has really quickly become my go-to pistol. It's simple, it's affordable and reliable, but most importantly, it's really fun to shoot. The Ruger Security 9 family has a textured glass fiber nylon grip, giving you a secure and comfortable hold of the pistol, even in adverse conditions or with sweaty palms. If you like a solid mid-sized pistol, the standard model weighs in at 23.8 ounces and has a four inch, one in 10 twist steel blued barrel. This pistol fits nicely in your hand, especially for someone who has small hands like myself. A compact version runs on a 10 round flush fitting magazine or a 15 round extended magazine. You can go online to Ruger.com to check out all of the options available in the Security 9. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We are here at Hunt Expo at the Ruger booth and I am with my good friend Travis Ishida, the founder of the NRL Hunter series. Travis, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy weekend because there's so much to do here and sitting down and talking to us. <laughs> this thank is you. very impressive, but absolutely thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I love uh, doing anything that we can to support you guys yeah. in the show and it's love just working awesome together. To be here, it's awesome. Sure. Yeah. This is a great weekend and this is totally like the perfect market to promote NRL Hunter. I mean, everybody out here is a Western big game hunter and everybody should be that's coming here shooting a match. I agree 100%. This is definitely the demographic that we want to reach. 100%. And it's just awesome to meet so many new people. We have a lot of our sponsors here yeah. um, and a lot of our friends. So getting the word out mm -hmm. is just, you know, it's key and it's phenomenal to have such a huge crowd here in one spot for the next, what, three days, four days, whatever I it is. I think it's four total. Four I, I don't know. I kind of black out once in a while. I'm like, <laughs> how many days have I been here? Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and then the shows all kind of run together. But yeah, this one, I like it because it is four days because, you know, like some of the shows like Sheep Show, I love the, that show but they don't have that Sunday. Right. And so I always feel like we're missing out on opportunity to connect or I feel like it's not quite enough time sometimes. So um, it's it, nice it to have hard. the full four days. But here Sunday is Super Bowl. It is. Brittany was so mad. What? She's, You're she's not like, going to be able to eat that food yeah. at home. You're going to be missing I'm like, out. <laughs> I'm like, it's Super Bowl. She's like, I just want the food. I <laughs> I'm know, like, right? Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody will have some something going on. <laughs> we'll yeah. figure it out. Yeah, we'll I crash know. somebody's party. Well, because she's not here. <laughs> She, well, she's going to be here on Saturday and Sunday. She's okay. actually in the hotel doing work. She's got conference calls and things like that. I mean, she has an adult big girl job also. Yeah. 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 So she's got to make sure that, you know, she keeps that uh, keeps mm -hmm. that going. And so she'll be here this weekend. So okay. she'll definitely we'll come by and see her. Yeah, that'd yeah. be awesome. So for those of you listening and watching, um, NRL Hunter is 
kind of different, I think, in my opinion, from any other match that's out there. And, you know, when you hear about, like, oh, a, a shooting competition, a lot of times that can be super intimidating. Yes. But you guys have designed a format that is supposed to remove or removes that um, barrier of entry, number one, if you've never shot a match and you want to, and you don't have gear, you guys are super awesome. You have a trailer that's totally kitted out thanks to some of your amazing partners with firearms, optics, ammo, yes. Kestrels, bags, bags, bipods, tripods, like anything that somebody that has never shot a match would need, they can pre-register with you and you know organize this on the front end and say, hey, we want to shoot a match, but I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. And, I'm to and it's, it, it is a totally a gear bomb. Like it's a lot to like kind of learn at first. And so you, you remove that barrier of entry to where it's something that anybody can go try at least once to see if it's something they want to participate in. Right. I mean, the biggest thing, and, and you and I, we've been there before, we're like, we buy something, we're not quite sure, mm -hmm. and we end up spending a small fortune or sometimes yeah. a large well, fortune. Well, it's not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> right. Trying to yeah. figure out what works for us. Yeah. So what we're trying to do with our loaner program, with our amazing partners, is show people the different types of gear that a lot of people are using so that they can get comfortable with it and figure out if it yeah. works for them yeah. before they go out and, and spend the money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you said, you basically, I think we have like enough gear that if like six people showed up, they could literally be fully kitted yeah. and go shoot a competition or go hunt big game. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people, you know, they don't know how to get their data. And that's, I think that's a big barrier of entry is people are it like, is. well, I don't know, you know, how do I dial my scope or does my scope dial? Do I have the right gear to be able to do that? And so you guys walk everybody through the process kind of on the front end, on sight end day, get them hooked up, get them shooting, engaging and hitting targets at distance before they, they walk out into a match. And so they're not just like completely lost. You guys do a lot of mentoring, which I think is so important important because it is very overwhelming. It is, absolutely. And one of the biggest things that we kind of, like I like to pitch is education through competition, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of hunters traditionally, you know, they'll take out their hunting rifle a week, a month, whatever it is before their big hunt. And they shoot four, five, 10, 15 rounds. At a, you know, at a paper plate, right? And that's fine, but that's Off a bench at a hundred yards. Right, yeah. and that's old school. There's, there is better ways to train. Yes, absolutely. And with the technology in the firearms and the optics and in the Kestrels and the wind meters and all the data that's available, there's really no reason why you shouldn't be using that gear. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is teach people how to use that gear in its simplest format because, I mean, it's that old adage, kiss, right? Keep it simple, stupid, right? Yeah. As long as we keep it yeah, simple for everybody. Yeah, that's the motto of my life. <laughs> my, that's my life slogan. <laughs> you you hear that? Mine full. Yeah. <laughs> But as long as we keep it simple for people, yeah. it's really not hard to learn. And then the excitement that they get when you can show them, you know, a five or 600 yard target yeah. and they're able to make first round impacts. Yeah, I mean, that excitement it's on their face. It is. It's life changing. I remember when I started um, taking shooting lessons, it was because, you know, I had been on a cow elk hunt and I couldn't shoot 400 yards. I wasn't comfortable. I wasn't competent. I didn't have fu good fundamentals. I had horrible fundamentals. I mean, I was that person that I would shoot and my head instantly came off the scope and I'm looking around. I had no idea what follow through was. Right. I mean, I just really didn't know. And you don't know what you don't know. And it doesn't make you bad. It just, you know, is it should be a driving force to help you want to be the best you can be so that you can be Absolutely. the most ethical hunter. And that's really what drove me to start learning more about um, precision shooting sports and having correct fundamentals and, and being a good ambassador for hunting um, as a whole. And so your guys' format, what I love about it is super cool because... You know, you, you get your gear or you bring your gear. You can, you have several weight classes. Yes. So you have a heavy class, which would be under 16, 16. pounds. Yes. And then, which is typically what I run is the heavy class. I'll, I'll run an RPR. Um, and you have to, you have a minimum power factor. Yeah, so I'll run, 000. what is it again? 380,000. Okay. So how do people figure that just for the guy or girl listening? So power factor is determined by your bullet weight times your velocity equals X, Y, Z. Yeah. And the reason that we have a minimum power factor is because that number has been deemed as what a ethical power factor would be to hunt Western big game. Yeah. So obviously, you know, there's people that are taking shots at animals with small calibers and things that 
a lot of people wouldn't necessarily consider ethical. So we want to make sure that when we're doing these type of competitions, again, we're trying to educate people, use the right gear mm -hmm. for the right you know, opportunity or the right hunt that you're going to go on. So we try to do everything that we can with weight, uh, weight restrictions on the rifles. So like you said, open heavy 16 pounds or less, open light is 12 pounds or less, and factory is 12 pounds or less. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's your, your rifle, your optic, your, your bipod. Everything that everything. you're going to have on your firearm has to weigh under those weight classes. So, you know, obviously the lighter rifles are going to have more recoil. The shots are going to be a little more challenging to spot, which is why I run the heavy class. Right. Um, I'm running uh, you know, the typical minimum power factor. I think you cartridge wise that you see out there is like six, five Creedmoor. Yes. Very common. And that's what I run. And then I run it on the heavy division. Um, and, but there's a lot of people that man, they take like their really super sporty oh, hunting yeah. rifles out there that are, you know, eight pounds with optics and they're, they're shooting seen, matches. Oh, it, it's, it's crazy, but it's impressive. Yeah. We've seen eight pounds, seven mags, Yeah. you know, and, and it's like, okay, that's, you know, one or two shots, most people can handle that, yeah. but shooting upwards of a hundred shots in a in weekend a day, yeah. or, you know, in a day, it's, that's going to, yeah. that's going to put a bruise on your shoulder. It doesn't matter how big you are. No. It's, you know, that's no, tough. You're going to feel it for sure. Yeah. hundred percent. No. Um, so there's, there's, there's the minimum power factor. So you can bring your hunting rifle. You can enter into different weight classes, depending on what your comfort level is. And that's, what's great. But you also have youth divisions. We have a youth division and the youth division, they can shoot any rifle they want under 16 pounds. Um, they still have to meet the minimum power factor. And the youth division is absolutely my favorite. Yeah. Um, I'm, we have a great story of a young gun, 14 years old, last season shot his first NRL hunter season. He shot a, a couple of matches. And then during the hunt, he went, and I can't remember if it was a mule or a whitetail, but he shot a deer around 400 yards off a tripod, 100% confident by himself with his dad by his side, mm -hmm. just letting his son do his thing. Mm -hmm. Now, a 14-year-old taking a 400-yard shot is not... It's not common. No, especially not off a tripod. Right? And, and even adults have a hard time yeah. doing that. But he had the confidence in taking that shot, which I think confidence plays a big role oh, in anything, right? And knowing your limitations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But he was 100% com comfortable with it. And we have, you know, uh, a, the story about it on our website. But he dropped that deer mm -hmm. in its tracks right there. And it was you know, the most rewarding hunt he's had. Well, and I'm sure what an incredible moment for his family to see him you know, have that confidence in the field. And I, you know, taking a lot of kids hunting and even being, you know, a novice in my own life, I remember, you know, the first time I tried to shoot off a tripod and I didn't really understand that the reticle does not hold steady. Right. And um, you deal with other things like level of magnification and finding a target and yes. having follow up. And these are things, you know, you see a lot of people that don't train or practice really struggle with, which is common because if you've never tried it, it's not going to come naturally to you. So that's what I love about the matches is it really gets you off the bench in really testing your equipment. Um, what I also love about it is every stage is blind. Yes. So, if you're a kid, you're coming in, your parent can mentor you. If you're coming in and you've never shot, um, you can have a mentor. As long as they, if they're competing, they have to shoot the stage first and then they can mentor you and they, you just basically audit the match for training purposes, which I've done that. We filmed an right. episode on that um, two years ago. Two years ago. And so you can come in and you can audit it and have someone help you. And so everything is blind. You have a four minute time, time frame and in that four minutes, you have to locate your targets and they give you a right and a left lateral limit. So when you walk up to the stage, they'll have uh, the match director will tell you right and left lateral limits. Um, a lot of times you'll have to run into the shooting area. So yes. it's blind. So a lot of times you have to go over some sort of terrain feature or around a terrain feature, locate the targets, range estimate the targets, get your data for the targets and engage the targets. And so it's four minutes. So you know what I, the, my trick on it is I run a timer at two minutes I better have the targets found ranged and be getting ready to shoot absolutely now that's kind of like a pro tip right if you have everything found and ranged in two minutes and you have two minutes to shoot that should be enough time for you to be relaxed and comfortable but there's a lot of people that you know the, the why people ask is why do you have a four minute time limit and so on and mm -hmm. so forth is because the only way we can emulate that buck fever yeah or that stressor is to put you under time is to put you under time right so we've seen professional marksmen that shoot in like prs style shooting and stuff mm -hmm. 
come out to hunter matches and because they literally have to figure out how to do everything on their own yeah. in a time frame in a box so to speak in a certain uh space um a lot of them turned into a yard sale yeah they, they just aren't sure how to do that yeah. and well because in a traditional prs match um what you guys will see if you go to a match is you'll have squads of people everybody walks up to the stage uh and what i mean by stage is the course of fire um and the targets are known the distances are known so you can sit and watch all your friends shoot watch them hit or miss you can watch all of your friends use their gear prepare their gear see are they shooting with a bipod is the bipod on the front end of the rifle or is the bipod moved back right you know where is the bipod located in position to their hand guard? Um, are they sitting? Are they kneeling? Are they standing? Are they using one bag? Are they using two bags? You know, so you get to watch all these people before you shoot, and you get to kind of think through a match plan or a stage plan. Right. NRL Hunter removes all of that. You yes. walk up a hundred percent blind. You carry in a backpack the things that you might need. Mm -hmm. So all day long, you're rucking your gear. You don't just leave, you know, all the stuff you don't need behind you. You have to bring it all with you. And so it is very different in that regard from a traditional, like, PRS match. Right, because what we're trying to do is emulate a actual hunting, hunting scenario, situation. right? Yeah. I mean, you're not very... Very few people will actually drop stuff when they're hunting, yeah. and then they'll mark it with their Onyx or whatever app they're using. But most people don't do that because we've all lost stuff oh doing that. Oh, my gosh. It's yeah. by that tree. Well, well, what? well, I dropped my <laughs> shoes 200 yards back here somewhere on this stalk, and I have no idea where my shoes are now. <laughs> right? And so it's we, we try to teach people how to actually be in a hunting scenario, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we've had people yard sale some stuff. and. Yeah. I keep it and they don't get it back until the end of the weekend and sometimes they have to you know bribe me with a tasty treat or something ah! <laughs> uh dairy queen cherry dilly bars thank right? you very much <laughs> i've had tripods left behind and yeah. i hold on to them I, yeah. I need my tripod but dude you lost that on the ridge back there yeah it's yeah. in your hand yeah you lost it in the ridge back there yeah so you're kind of enforcing some some uh you're flexing some mountain muscle if you will on them yeah because you want to t teach good habits yeah right i mean gear if you, management is a very very important habit and you lose something when you're hunting it's gone it right? is yeah and it's not only you know the cost of that piece of equipment right it, whatever that cost it's is the opportunity but it's, that it provides you right i mean you might need that to either spot or to take a shot or mm -hmm. or you might even need it to to set up a shelter whatever it is mm -hmm. You just lost that because you were irresponsible with your gear. Mm -hmm. So we're punishing you if you leave it behind. But, it, I mean, you yeah. know, you're going to get it back at the end of the weekend. Yeah. But you no longer have that asset for that yeah. match. Yeah, you guys are kind of running a tight ship on that. Now, again, if you're auditing the match, you're not doing that. You're like, oh, yeah, man, bro, next time learn right. from this. Because um, there are some new shooters that, that don't, you know, they, they want help. They want coached. And, right. And what I did find, too, when I was uh, mentoring um before uh the the actual ro's at those stages were really helpful too yes. like hey you know this is a new shooter we're mentoring and the ro's at the match were some awesome help like they really gave a lot of input like hey we've seen some people do this and this has worked best for them right. and so it, it's a whole support community and so it is a competition but it's also friendly competition it is and you know, our, our And that's only if you're auditing it, right? Let me right. just clarify that. Like if you walk up to a stage normally the match director or not the match the RO RO is not gonna help you. Right. So we, when Chrissy's talking about our audited matches or our audited individuals, that's what we call our skills division. Mm -hmm. And that's because we want these people to learn the skills to become better hunters. So we're there 100%. The entire staff is there to help make sure that they're not only having fun, but they're learning something, mm -hmm. right? And your mentorship with the gentleman two years ago, yeah. that was awesome. You took him on a, he went to hunt with you. Yeah, you we went mule deer hunt. hunting, yeah. And that was absolutely Standing phenomenal. tripod shot, nailed it. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And so what we try to do is, you know help you figure out how to find targets how to figure out what position to be in yeah. that would be most comfortable for you to take that shot because the last thing that we want you to do is walk away frustrated but if you're walking away frustrated and educated that's okay yeah well right? and what I love too um, about competing and I didn't do a match last year and I went into this hunting season and I told my husband I was like my confidence is not quite where it is when I'm 
when I shoot a match or two um, or three because when you do that, it you become, you know, it's, shooting is a perishable skill. Absolutely. So you really reinforce that unconscious competence with repetition and practice. And, you know, you have two days over the course of a weekend to make some mistakes where you're like, Ugh. and honestly, for me, what I find, most of my mistakes are, are like mental meltdowns, like for sure. getting the targets out of order or, you know, going in the wrong sequence or like mental frustrations that happen with, for me, like low blood sugar, like learning that I need to right. eat. And you see that on a hunt too. It's the same thing. Like if you go too long without eating, your brain is not functioning at full capacity. And, and so it just helps me kind of hone in on all of the things that I really need to focus or train or think about. When I'm hunting, I walk into the field with so much more confidence. Absolutely. Because, I mean, we talk about precision rifle or shooting as a perishable skill, but hunting is a perishable skill. 100%. Right? I mean, if you don't know, if you can't remember how to spot, if you can't remember how to track, if you can't remember you know, how to shoot. Yeah, I mean, the, even the simplest things, if you don't remember what that knot was to tie up your tent, yeah. things get bad and frustrating kind of quick, oh, right? Oh, for sure. So we want people that are going to be hunting for the first time or their hundredth yeah. time to practice these skills during the off season so that they are more successful during when they're out. During the season. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I like about it is it helps you define your limitations. Um, you know, like, Last year, my husband and I had two deer, two different yardages, and he's like, look, I'm not comfortable shooting that distance. So he laid down, we were shooting suppressed, and he shot one deer, and then the other deer was still standing out a little farther at distance, and I was like, game on, here we go. Yeah. Like, he wasn't comfortable doing it, but I was, and so we, in essence, kind of doubled up. Um, and... It, but for me, like, had I not trained, I would have been like, ooh, I can't do that shot either. Right. Or for him, he hadn't trained as much as I have. And, and even though he had the same firearm I was using, he just wasn't comfortable with that. And I think that's really important as an ethical hunter is identifying those limitations, like where you're comfortable with yardage. Absolutely. And I always tell people that people say, well, how far what's your farthest shot you've taken on an animal? And they want to, you know, kind of compare notes. I hunt as close as I can. Absolutely. For me... The, the, the important part is how close can I get? Right. Um, and there are some situations where your distance is as close as you're going to get. And then it goes to, okay, well, what are the conditions? What type of shooting position can I build? How much time do I have? What is the wind doing? Right. Um, what is my comfort level with, like, my breath cycle? Am I gassed? Um, do I have elbow support if I'm shooting off a tripod kneeling? Or, if I, you know, where, where am I at functionally? Um, and then I make that call when I'm there. Like, okay, you know what? I can't do the shot right now. I'm just, I can't hold reticle steady or right. the wind is too strong or I'm just not, this just isn't going to work for me. The angle's wrong, whatever. And then I'm, I feel better as a hunter walking away from an opportunity like, hey, no, I made the right decision. I did not take that shot. And I don't live with that second guess. Because I hear people all the time like, man, I should have took that shot and I didn't. And it's like, no, never regret the shot you don't take. Right. But train the best that you can to be the most ethical you can in, in multiple situations. And if you feel like you can't do it, then there's no shame in that. No, absolutely. I mean, it's all about comfort and knowing, knowing your limits. And it's a mature, and when I'm saying mature, it's a, um, I'm talking about mentally mature hunter that can decide that's the right shot or not. Mm -hmm. Because we've all had friends that were first time hunters or, or newer hunters mm -hmm. that as soon as they get on an animal, they yank that shot yeah. and, and it goes over or God forbid it wounds the animal or whatever. Um, and those are the things that we're trying to eliminate mm -hmm. by competition, right? So if you're at a stage and you're running out of time, you have you know less than a minute on the clock and you're just starting to shoot, you're gonna figure out real quick how accurate you can be in a very short amount of yeah. time. And if you can't do it in a confined, restricted area on at a match on steel, do not do it in the wild. A hundred percent. Right? Yeah. And people say, you know, well, you're you're trying to advocate for long range hunting. No, it's the exact opposite. No, we're advocating for ethical hunting. Yes. You know, I would much rather teach somebody what they can do at 500 yards so that when they're at 200 yards, they have 100% confidence. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm Christy Titus, and for the past several years, I've really come to rely on OnX Hunt for mapping both in and out of the field. But now I'm also using it to plan and research units for my application season. OnX has teamed up with TopRet to show you 
everything that you need for draw odds in most of the Western states. And access to Top Rat services is completely free to all Elite members. I now have both the power of Onyx Hunt and Top Rat to help me strategize my state hunting applications. If you haven't already, download Onyx Hunt and upgrade to the Elite membership to access Top Rut as well as other great Elite benefits. I practice shooting, so when I was on a, an elk hunt, my first ever bull elk hunt here in Utah, I practiced with Paul Dallin, who, who's a local here. Oh, we love Paul. Yeah, Hi, Paul. Shout out, Paul. He'll be You're here amazing. this weekend. I love him. Yeah, He's he, amazing. He is awesome. He'll be yeah. here this weekend. Great guy. Um, and incredible shooter. Incredible. He's one of the top shooters in the nation. He is a... And the most humble, nice human you'll oh, ever yeah. meet. Yeah. And he's a super accomplished hunter. Hunted all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, when I went, he was helping me with my hunt. Mm -hmm. we, we went to his range. And he wanted me to be able to shoot under time a thousand yards, mm -hmm. right? And be consistent with it. So we went through our reputations, you know, and did all that with the mag in the pocket, getting it in, uh, into position, getting the mag loaded, getting on target and getting a shot. He wanted me to get all that. I can't remember if it was like 15 or 20 seconds. He wanted me to get all that done in that time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. So the gear reason, at hand in under 20 seconds, first round fired. Yes. Yeah. And, and hit. Well, because a lot of these top guys are first round fire under 12 seconds. Yes. I mean, they are gear in hand, mag in, build position, hit a target in 12 seconds or less. It, and it is unreal. It's absolutely insane. And 20 seconds is insane. And I don't, I'm not a speed shooter. Yeah. But he was explaining to me that when you see him, you got to be ready yeah. to go. So and you're replicating stress that you'd feel on a hunt right. at that point in a controlled area absolutely and i had the discussion with paul you know paul i'm not going to shoot an elk at a thousand yards yeah. i'm not shooting an animal any animal at that no i don't distance. either and he's all i know i want you to do that because if you're comfortable at a thousand yards wherever it is in your range yeah. you are going to have that confidence yeah. so i ended up shooting my elk at you know 540 mm -hmm. yards mm -hmm. and i was 100 percent confident and yeah. comfortable in my shots right because we trained at further distances yeah. and we shot at steel mm -hmm. to figure out what did and what didn't work. Mm -hmm. So it's not about, you know, who can shoot the furthest. Yeah. It's who can shoot the closest, yeah. right? That's what hunting 100%. is. 100%. I always try to get close. Like this year, I shot an elk and it, it wasn't the closest shot I've ever taken. It was actually one of the farthest shots I've ever taken. And I was prone and I had lots of time and the elk had been bedded and we waited for him to stand up. And when he stood up and started grazing, I took my shot all the time in the world. I was so comfortable. It was like perfect. But the elk, I shot him in the shoulder, perfect shot, mind you. But he went down into like a little creek bottom and out of sight. And I lost my shit, like full panic oh, yeah. mode. Cause I've kind of gotten a little spoiled in that I've seen a lot of my animals when I shoulder shoot them just drop, right? right? Like I'm kind of used to that. Okay, I'm going to hit you in the shoulder and you're going to just dump. And I, I like that. Right. For me, I'm like, yes, okay, he's down. Well, that's the best. You don't yeah, have to track him. I don't, I'm not stressing. <laughs> yeah. This thing disappears into this drainage and I'm like, you know, Yogi and I, gear bomb, I'm not even doing like the video stuff I need to do. And I'm like in panic mode because... I didn't see him go down right. and we run down and we're get up above where we, where I'd shot and we're looking down to this Creek bottom and I'm like panicking and I'm, I'm looking for this big elk, right? Like maybe he's crawling up the other side. I had no idea in my mind. I have like every, right. and he was so small in that Creek bottom laying there. He didn't go 50 yards, but I just was like, panic because I always want to do the best I can for an animal. Absolutely. I want to give them the most ethical, humane um, death that I can possibly deliver, right? Like, Absolutely. I mean, I love animals. And when I saw that elk laying there, I got teary-eyed because, like, I, I just was like, I didn't see him go down. And it right. just, I, I know I had trained, I had all this time, and I, the shot felt good, everything looked great on the on the video, but still... Like you always want to make it as perfect as you can. And that is the exact reason why I train as hard as I do, yes. because I always want to make sure that I've done everything I can to prepare for that moment. A absolutely. Right. I mean, if you take that shot and that animal, you know, drops immediately or only goes, you know, 50, whatever, you yeah. know, a, sh a short distance, that is the way it's supposed to be done because yeah. now you've, 
virtually eliminated a ton of work. Yeah. Right. Physically, physically tracking that animal, mm -hmm. but it's a peace of mind. Yeah. Right. It's it's absolutely, you know, I I had that feeling at, on a um, a mule deer hunt in Arizona, and we had to wait. Uh, my friend was like, "We need to wait about an hour, right? So we don't bump this deer." Yeah. And for that hour, I oh, just, you just sick to your stomach, sick to my stomach, yeah. panicked. Like, what if this? What if that? Mm -hmm. You know, the thought of I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. You know, came into my because it was, it was actually the first mule deer I had ever shot, mm -hmm. right? And I was, and you doubt yourself a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, and and that was an archery hunt. Yeah. That that wasn't a rifle hunt. That was an archery hunt. Um, and so I was just like, what if this? What if that? You know. Mm -hmm. And luckily, it, it was actually. We ended up finding the deer, but it was not where we thought it yeah. would be. It, well, they never are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it ran, yeah. ran around this corner, and there was a field, and we're like, oh, it's got to be right here. Yeah. It ended up jumping another another little berm or yeah. whatever that was thick. And we're like, it's not going to be there. And my gut feeling just said, go that way. And I went, and it was there. That's so awesome. So we were super lucky that we retrieved it because we were literally searched for like two hours in yeah. that area, and we're like, it's not here. And mm -hmm. just my gut said, go that way, and I did. Mm -hmm. Um and That's that, also why they have those TAC events, the Total Archery Challenge yes. events. Which are, have you shot one? I haven't. I want to, but they oh, always conflict dude, with my schedule. you got to come to one. They're so fun. I do, um, I it do, is do a, They're really good. It, it's really similar to NRL Hunter, but with a bow. So you have realistic target situations. And some that are, for me, unrealistic. You know, I'm not hunting at 70, 80, 90, 100 yards. Yeah, I'm not. But I'll yeah. shoot my bow at those distances. Um, actually, this year is the first year that I really could shoot that far with my bow so that was like game changing for me with the the new trophy ridge sights but um anyway those are super fun too you have big angles and and it's really similar to what you guys are doing and i think whether you're rifle hunting or you're bow hunting training is the ultimate in giving you confidence yes. and you know not everything goes right on a hunt and no it never goes right yeah it, i mean i mean yeah it, there's things happen you sometimes have to, and, you have to adjust right yeah and it's it's nice to know okay well i've trained i've done everything i can to be the best i can and you live with yourself a little better if things go wrong right so i mean the, the gist of the story here or the podcast is is training 100 percent. right so whether it's with your your local you know uh, rifle club that's in the area, yeah. or you're coming to one of the matches, or a one day mm -hmm. match, or, or or whatever, just get out there and train. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of so there's a lot of really good reputable uh, rifle trainers out there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of guys out there that really shouldn't be training. So kind of do your homework yeah. and figure out who you should be taking classes from even if they cost more there's usually a reason why they mm -hmm. cost more it's because they know what they're doing mm -hmm. you know there's i mean we're here at the hunt expo and somebody's going to be buying their dream tag or dream hunt or yeah. whatever this week right don't pick up your rifle a month before you fly to you know africa or, or mm -hmm. wherever you're going sweden wherever you're going and say that that's going to be good enough. I mean, if you're going to invest the time and the money to get that tag and make those arrangements, put some into your training in and yourself your gear, in and your understanding your gear yes. and your limitations. And a lot of people, I think, make the mistake. They think they can spend a ton of money on a big, fancy custom rifle and it's going to buy them success. It won't. And you can't buy success. I mean, fundamentals are not bought. They're, they're learned. And learning your equipment how it operates and being quick with it is so important like i think for me like on my mule deer hunt in oregon my shot from the time we saw the deer to when i actually shot it was under 10 seconds wow and i did a, fast it was so fast so we had um we had a three by three come up this drainage and he jumped a bigger buck that was bedded um, that I had tried to shoot a couple days before and he gotten away from me because I wouldn't take a 700 yard standing tripod shot. Yeah, I wouldn't either. I was like, look, I I want to try to get closer to this deer. He's 700 yards right now. I'm not comfortable doing a standing tripod shot. So I walked away from the, the opportunity. Yogi and I followed up with the deer. He was bedded 80 yards from where we ate lunch behind a piece of sagebrush. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and. Like, we're, like, talking normal, blah, 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 and the deer doesn't move. He holds tight, and as soon as we go back on our stock, because we're, like, still hunting for this buck, he bolts out, and it was like somebody just smacked him on the butt. Like, he was gone. <laughs> right. So I was like, great. You know, this was the biggest, oldest deer we had seen in, at that point, it was, like, eight days into the hunt. And um, 
and I was really disappointed. And so we see this three point coming up this canyon and that buck had made a big circle. And this was like, we were in his bedroom zone. He was in the same spot, the exact same ridge I had passed on shooting him at 700 yards two days before. And he jumps out of his bed and he runs out where there had been some does at 450. Right. And I knew that this saddle was in range. So he runs out and I had my tripod already set up Yogi ranged him. I had my arm board because yep. I always hunt with an arm board and I, people make fun of me online all the time. I'm like, what are you, like an armchair quarterback? You run in a football game? Is that your playbook? And it's like, no, it's my data chart because when stuff happens fast, I want to look at my arm and know what I have to dial. So Yogi has his binoculars. He ranges the deer as it's running and as I'm throwing my rifle down on the tripod. And he's starting to stop the deer and you can hear me on camera. I'm like, no, no, I have to <laughs> dial. Don't, I'm not ready. Like, no. And he's like, I have to stop him. And he's screaming at the deer and I'm like dialing and I get on the deer and I shoot. And it happened in literally like 10 seconds. Happened so fast. I actually delivered a follow-up shot. So I shot the deer once and I did a follow-up shot and the deer was actually moving at that point, which I don't advocate for like shooting right. moving, but it was a follow-up. I got a good lead on him and I delivered a, a well-placed second follow-up shot at distance also. And he went down and bedded behind a tree and there he was when we were all done. But it was like, it happened, the whole thing happened so fast. If I hadn't have trained you know, and known, like when we saw that deer run out, I instantly threw my gun up there, got my data and was on him. It, it happened so fast. If I hadn't have trained, I, I don't think I could have made that shot. No, absolutely. I mean, that's that muscle memory yeah. that you get from training, right? And it, it's like, and, and there were so many hunts this year where we had the really fast opportunities like that that happened. Some years it's just like that. It you is. Know, things happen yeah. quick. Yeah. They're just all constantly on the move some, some years, right? It's yeah. just... It just is what it Even is. Even my antelope hunt this year, I had an antelope buck at like 650, and I wanted to, it was a buck that we were pursuing. And I was, it was kneeling tripod, and I just couldn't get my wobble right. And I, I told Yogi and my cameraman, I'm like, look, I just, my wobble zone's too big here. I'm going to miss this thing. We've been hunting for five days. No. I've waited 16 years for this tag. I don't need to blow it on this deer or this no. antelope. So we actually moved up, got closer. I think my shot on my antelope was what, like 370 or something like that? perfect shot dumped him That's i mean awesome. and and but these matches the nrl hunter series is that place where you can shoot that 650 yard shot and not worry about any negative consequences exactly so that when you are hunting you can say look without a doubt i can't make this shot i i need to get closer i'm breathing too hard or whatever the reason for me it was like my breathing was 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 going too much, my reticle, I couldn't hold steady, and I was like, I, I'm not doing it. I'll right. just wait, or, or we'll come back tomorrow. The antelope's not going anywhere, right? Like, I'd, I'd rather just hold off on that opportunity and make sure it's a successful ending. Hey, absolutely, I mean, you want to be ethical, right? Yeah. Nobody wants to shoot and wound an animal. It's not what hunting's about. It's, you know, it's fair chase. It's getting in there, yeah. it's making it happen. It's, again, there's something like 15 million hunters in the United States right yeah. now, right? Then our all hunter matches. We have 20 matches in the next eight months. We our season ends in August, so that people can take what they learned and actually uh, apply, apply it, it when during they hunt, hunting season. Right? Yeah. So it's something that every hunter, every responsible hunter, in my opinion, now should be taking some kind of a training mm -hmm. class to to hunt. I mean, if yeah. you're if you're back east and you know you're you're shooting in the timbers and whatever uh at whitetail at 100 yards yeah but a lot you of those still... whitetail are like running shots and yeah i mean like we're hunting whitetail and you have a whitetail buck chasing a doe and he runs out across a field and i mean you better have that thing stopped you have to age judge them and be on the gun yep. it happens quick like you need training for that too even if it's a 100 yard shot because of the momentum of when they're chasing right it's so sure. intense like i've not only have to make this shot good but i have to age and judge the animal in seconds right which like, is extremely difficult to do very now, difficult I don't, I don't know if you know this or not but when you were in missouri last november yeah i was there too hunting yeah so we were in the same yeah i think you were doing an archery hunt i was, yeah, on I was rifle bow hunting hunt. and i was bow hunting during gun season yeah and i was like why is she bow hunting and i'm like it's Christy. Let her do what she wants. Yeah, I know. Well, I had a buck that I really wanted to harvest. And, um, yeah, he just never gave me a shot. I had him at, like, 55 yards. And um, there's, like, one branch 
that he was at a licking tree and there's like one branch I couldn't take the shot and it, 55 yards is a little push for me on whitetail they're pretty yeah. small and I was like eh, I'm not even gonna try and then never saw him again and then um and then the day after I left he showed back up I'm like Argh! and I passed on so many deer we uh, rattled in a ton we I mean it was a great hunt we had tons of fun but I with whitetail I really try to hunt age right so no, that's awesome just, yeah so out of curiosity do you prefer bow hunting or rifle hunting more so I love bow hunting. Don't get me wrong. Like I love bow hunting elk because I like calling them and I like being very close, but I like rifle hunting. Like I'm a, I'm a, I like shooting firearms. Like I, I enjoy and get more of a, an adrenaline rush when right. I shoot a firearm than I do with a bow. Um, and I love like the tack shoots and all of that. And they're, they're really fun. And I, I shoot for bear archery and I love shooting my bear bow. Well, I've been able to shoot and do more with my bare bow than I've ever been able to do with any other bow. Right. Um, but there's the, the adrenaline rush that I get when I shoot a match is it's so addicting. Like people that have never done it might you like, oh, yeah, it's loud or it's whatever. But I wear double ear protection when I'm shooting. Um, I, I shoot. Typically with a muzzle break at the matches, um, I, I like to hunt, like last year was my first season hunting suppressed. Okay. And I really like that because I get a little negligent uh, in the field with wearing ear protection right. when I'm hunting. But for me, you know, I, I'm a rifle hunter. I, I think hunting suppressed is absolutely the way to go if you're allowed yes. to do that. Yeah. Um, when I travel, because I'm in California, yeah, I, okay. I'm in California. We're I not judging him. <laughs> Today's not judgment day T- for today's you. Not, and <laughs> there's a lot of states getting as bad or worse in California That's right now. That's why we moved out of Oregon. I know. Trust <laughs> right? me. Yeah. Um, we won't get into that. No. But, you know, typically when I'm going to a state that, um, that allows suppressed hunting, I'm usually with a friend and I yeah. usually, you know, I'm shooting their gear yeah. or, or Bar whatever. Or suppressor, as Bar long suppressor. as they're present, whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so suppressed hunting is absolutely, it's absolutely phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, just hunt. Well, Yogi shot a deer this year and I'm one ridge over watching the deer and I didn't even hear him shoot. Like he was shooting suppressed and we're, I was like 500 yards from him. And I never heard the gunshot. Yeah, it's never awesome. heard it. It was awesome. Like, it's awesome. and then you know when you're when you're there and you're doing this and you're hunting a lot. I mean, you know, safety is such an important concern. And you guys can come shoot an NRA hunter match and bring your suppressor and shoot For suppressed sure. as well. Absolutely. It just has to make the weight factor right. Yes. So, um, and the, I mean the other great part that I like shooting suppressed is because, like, when there's a herd, whatever whatever size that is, every time I've shot into a herd of animals suppressed. And I shoot that animal. That animal usually drops, but the herd doesn't disperse. That's what happened with my antelope. The buck dropped, and the um, the antelope does were just kind of like, what? Not yeah, really what sure. Happened? They finally took off. Right. But they, but at first they were just standing there, really confused. Right. Yeah. So if you were theoretically shooting in pairs, you both mm-hmm. had tags or whatever, yeah. and there was two whatever that you wanted to shoot suppressed. I mean, it's it provides another level of opportunity mm-hmm. if you have the right equipment to do so, right? So speaking of Yogi, we were having a conversation the other night. When is he going to shoot a match? I know. You know, I love my husband. I, and it's interesting. Everybody's like, <laughs> a lot of people assume that my husband or my dad taught me to shoot. And both of those are incorrect. <laughs> I would have um, assumed it was your dad. Yeah, I know, no. I know um, when you married Yogi and you were shooting a long time before that. Yeah, no. So I learned to shoot through Magpul Core. Oh, and really? So, um, Kaylin Wojcik was my instructor for like five years, and then I, I've trained with a, a little bit with Max Ordnett, yeah. um, with Tyler over there, and I've trained a lot with Jake Vibbert. Right. Um, I've done some shooting with Paul Dallin. Um, and actually, Paul, his shooting containers is where it prompted <laughs> me to build my own shoot house, is from Paul. But um, no, Yogi, Yogi, I, you know, he's really great. He'll get behind the gun and he'll hit targets and he loves shooting. What he does is he'll get my my, um, Ruger Precision Rimfire, and he'll get out on my positional uh, barricades and platforms and stuff, and he'll shoot targets to like 200, 250 yards off with the 22, and he loves doing that. Nice. But he's not been like, let me shoot a match. I have all the gear for him to do it. I'm well, like, he told me it, last do night. Do it, but he's like, nah. He told me last night he wants to. I think he'd crush it. I, he'd probably beat me. Well, so it's funny. <laughs> he's like shaking his head no. He's like, no. I'm he, not. he won't be, beat you on the simple premise of you can't beat your wife. Yeah, you can. <laughs> no, you don't have, have to lose. lose. I'd pay Otherwise, to lose, it's, it's so. the couch. No. <laughs> no, he's 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 a really good shooter and does 
like he in Europe they they kind of train differently because they have to qualify for shooting moving targets. Okay. So from the time he got his hunter ed, part of that hunter ed process is in a simulation room. They have like a video screen that you can shoot live fire into like a video screen. They call it call it a shooting cinema. And part of your qualification is that you have to be able to shoot a running moose. Is it a pig too or just the moose? Mainly moose. So you have to be able to ethically harvest the moose running because they do a driven hunt. Right. So most of your shots in Europe are, are taken on a running animal. And so um, okay. they, he's, he's really good at, at shooting in that capacity under stress. Um, I've only shot a running animal. Well, I guess my follow-up shot on my deer last year. And then when we, we did an NRL um, hunter match in, in California two years right, ago. two years ago. And Jake's then we, match. yeah, we followed it up with a pig hunt. And the pig had ran from us, went down in a canyon and was running across the other side of a hill. And I just took a lead and, and put, you know, put my reticle right in, in front of his chest and he ran right into, right, right into my bullet. So it was perfect. But I mean, pigs to me, I mean, I don't want to call anything a low value target, but, um, you know, I'm fine taking a running shot on a pig. It's good practice, right? right? You pigs know, so. and coyotes are a little bit more dispensable. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, but I harvested the pig. It was great. We took the meat home. Actually, the other kid we were hunting with, he also harvested a pig. So we came home with two um, full pigs, and nice. it was awesome. But um, yeah, I'm trying to get him. I'm trying to get him. We'll work on him a little bit. We'll keep trying. And then even like the Night Forest does that ELR match, which is a total prone like belly match. I'm like, let's. You That's know, a shoot different it. beast, though. Yeah. Like, even shooting that match makes me nervous. Really? Yeah. You have so much time. You have four minutes. You're like, yeah, you lay down and like close your eyes and look at the target and was like it hang out. Last year or the year before, they had like 90 mile per hour winds and you're shooting targets at 2,000 yards and 90 yeah, mile per hour. Dude. The wind is, it's Wyoming. It rips. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It is. Yeah. I shot my first ELR match last year and then I'm going to shoot another one. I'm gonna, Well, because I go and RO that match. So right. I'll shoot it the day before with match directors again and, and then RO it. Nice. And so he's great. Like Yogi's awesome. Like he'll go RO a match with me and hang out and he's, he's good fun. He just hasn't, he just hasn't he's, like, eh, he's great support, but yeah. we got to put him in the limelight. Now. I'm trying. I'm trying. We'll yeah. get it. We'll get somebody else to run the cameras on you, on we, YouTube. We don't even have to film stuff. Yeah, don't we even just film go it. Hang just out. Yeah. Cell phone ahead. footage. <laughs> <laughs> that is not true. I told him. I'm like, just come shoot and have a good time, you know. And that's all it's about. Yeah, it is. And that's, you know, what I love about it. And this is what I really noticed last year. It's interesting. There's more little girls shooting there are. than there are little boys shooting. And you would think that little boys would be running everywhere with the youth divisions shooting with their dads. And I'll tell you right now, 10 to 1, it's been little girls. There's definitely more young females that yes. are coming out and enjoying the, the hunting and the shooting sports, yes. which is absolutely I phenomenal. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's huge. And even at the ELR match, there was three little girls that were all shooting. One of them was Hunter. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there was three little girls <laughs> that all shot the match, and one little girl, um, she, for her 16th birthday, told her dad she wanted to shoot an NRL match. So her dad brought her. You guys hooked her up with loaner kit. Yep. She did the prize table. Night Force sent her home with a rifle scope, and and some other manufacturers hooked her up with some gun accessories. And uh, she I think actually she got kitted out got with a full rifle. A full rifle. Yeah. Yeah. And a nice Night Force optics. That I don't even have one yet. Yeah. So she got <laughs> totally kitted out, and now she's shooting all the time. And um, uh, so it's great. Like this little girl is just crushing it, and now she's shooting extreme long range. And I'm like, holy she's, smokes. Like, yeah. Like every awesome, discipline with a rifle that she can shoot, she's yeah. all about. Yeah. And her dad shoots with her, but he's more like a tag along. Yeah. He's like yeah. there just to make sure she has fun and she's doing everything and the way she's supposed so to. And they're so cute. And that's what we want. We want more girls shooting. We want more girls showing up. But we want the boys to do it too, yeah, you guys. Don't, young don't guns. get us wrong. Yeah, We, we want, want young youth. guns and yeah. women. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and women. And that's the great thing. A lot of our matches actually give discounts to youth. Or if it's a, um, a youth and adult team. Yeah. So, like, if you're worried about the cost of entry and all of that kind of stuff, again, we have the loaner program. Um, and usually youth will get a discount at different matches. Yeah. So we try to make it as affordable as possible. Mm -hmm. But once the youth get hooked, 
it's out of my hands. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you guys, <laughs> out of my hands. get ready for that ammo bill to escalate. And my dad, he is so cute. He's so supportive of me. Like, you know, Yogi and I sold our big, beautiful place in Oregon, and we're kind of in limbo. We just found out today, I'm so excited, that um, we got an offer accepted on, on some acreage in Wyoming. But nice. we're like, I know, I'm, man, I'm. Thank you, Jesus. Um, but we're in limbo, so my dad's so cute. He has a space at his his place in, in Casper, and he has completely sheetrocked it. He's got it all decked out. He's painting it today, and he's having the guys build a bench. He's like, Christy, I, I really think what you should do is come down here and put all your reloading stuff down here, and we can reload <laughs> together. And, and I love it. Like, my dad is one of my biggest supporters, and that is the greatest thing. It is so bonding. I don't care how old you are. You can be a middle-aged upper middle-aged woman no, like myself no, 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 no. and you're still gonna want to hang out and shoot with your dad like you guys really keep this in mind because it's true like to this day my dad and i are still we hunt together we shoot together you know and and you know he's just been so so important in my life and and it's truly a bonding experience for your entire family it is and you know i come from a family where i'm actually the first person in my family to ever hunt yeah my dad doesn't hunt my uncles my mom nobody hunts yeah and so I'm the first one that's ever hunted, and it's a tradition and a passion of mine, obviously, yeah. that I can't wait to pass down when Brittany and I eventually have kids and, you know, hopefully... <laughs> they just got married. I know everybody. Hold on, you got married before us. When are you guys popping yeah, out? Yeah, no, I was just going to say this. Let me preface this. Number one, I'm too old. Um, no, no. But everybody asks me in yogi, like, when are you having kids? When are you having kids? And it's like, uh, no, we're not having kids. So we've been married long enough now. We're past that when you having kids thing. Now people just think something's wrong. <laughs> so everybody's afraid to ask. I'm like, no, we're not trying. It's all good. You guys would be such badass parents, though. Yeah. It's real hard to put kids in suitcases. <laughs> so, true. and then on the mountain, what we do, we just this decided we're good being aunts and uncles. Well, you guys are such world travelers. I mean, not only everything yeah. that you do stateside, but you guys yeah. do world travel quite a bit. So, I get it. Yeah. I mean, we we do a lot for our community. Like uh, when we go home in February next month, we're getting certified to be hunter ed instructors. Oh and hell yeah! So, you know, we we want to do a lot to reach and impact kids. It's just in our and own you way. do yeah, yeah and in you absolutely do. Yeah. You guys are are great ambassadors for the sport for the two A community. I mean, everything firearms related. You guys are awesome ambassadors, hunting ambassadors, but you guys are totally approachable. If that makes sense, like there's some people that are like have that celebrity status i get or, nervous talking to a lot of people if like like that are like super legit in their sport especially like you come to these matches and a lot of these guys are world-class shooters and you're like Ooh, oh my gosh that's so and so and they are you know and and you almost get a little nervous to talk to them but what i've found is that they're all just everybody's just we're just we're all people yeah. <laughs> nobody is better than anybody we're all just people yeah. and go shoot a but you it's, know, it's, strike up a conversation and, and yeah. We all have something to learn from each other. Yeah. Right? I mean, if I have a hunting question about an area I've never been to, I'm going to call you. Yeah. Because, you know, over the years we've become friends. Mm -hmm. And why would I not take advantage of that resource of your knowledge? I want you to start cooking for me. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Like, I've been following no all your cooking stuff. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. What's he cooking now? Like, no. you got it going on you, in the kitchen. You are. I don't know if it's you or Brittany, but one it, of you has really got it going on. <laughs> I say it's Brittany. She says it's both of us. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Right? Yeah, so yeah. she's she's really gotten into this wild game cooking yeah like that's time. the bonus of being a successful hunter is you get to eat it yeah <laughs> right i mean we are super super blessed we have elk we have whitetail we have mule deer we have axis deer mm -hmm. and we have wild boar in the fridge yeah. right now we have Axis two is the best i know it oh my. is the best i'm I, like oh i'm so like excited good. for this show but i can't wait to get home because they're finally sending me my mounts and my rugs oh how for exciting my access yeah so i'm like i want to see them i know they're so beautiful too yeah but you know, part of part of hunting is, you know, the the usage of that animal. Yeah. I try when I harvest an animal or kill an animal, whatever you guys want to say, I try to use as much of that animal as I can. And I, I think that's most hunters, ninety nine percent. Yeah. You know, but um, Brittany, I, I think he's here, and I've never met him. Hopefully, I meet him this week. You might know him, Chad Mendez. Oh yeah, I love Chad. He's yeah. awesome. Okay, she bought his cookbook. Oh yeah. And yeah. got it signed, like, you know, signed yeah. it before he sent it and all that. Um, and so she was like, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this, and this. And he has and I'm his like, own line of 
have food with um with peak with peak yeah uh, and, I, and spices yeah, or yeah right yeah he does spices and he's great i love chad yeah and he's an mma fighter for those of you that don't know chad mendez and he he's still actively fighting but he's also has this whole other i guess platform to where he can share the importance of hunting harvesting and then consumption yes and I love that about him. He's done such an incredible job to really reach people that otherwise might not have been impacted positively or had a positive look on hunting. Well, and that's the great thing because he had this huge audience as a uh, MMA, MMA fighter, U- yeah. UFC fighter. I mean, he's, he's fought the best in the world. He fought that's Conor right. McGregor, right? So he's had this that huge following. That would scare following, me. That right? man's scary. Right? Like, you have some cojones to do that, you know? <laughs> like, I meet, I meet Chad and I'm like, oh, he's so smiley and sweet. But I've not been on the other side where I got to take a punch from him, and I would not want to. No, hell no. Oh, no. No, no, no. Uh, hell no. I, I'd rather get kicked by a donkey. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. I have donkeys. You don't want those little things, even when their babies are nasty. <laughs> yeah, but a donkey's usually going to kick you once. Chad will just jump on top of you That's and keep true, hitting you. That's true, and then you. choke you out in the process. Ah. Right? <laughs> Uh, I might do it for a YouTube video. Yeah, no. right. Well, you could go arm wrestle him for YouTube. I mean, no, no. Uh, You'll no. dislocate your elbow. <laughs> I, I, I need it. my arm. We're Don't starting. We're starting match season. I need my. Yeah. <laughs> so you and Brittany are going to go hang out with him. You guys are learning. Uh, well, I hope cookbook. to meet, meet yeah, him. Yeah. yeah. But she loves getting these cookbooks and mm-hmm. figuring out different recipes, and yeah. she likes watching the Food Network and all that. And she'll yeah. just substitute, like if they're doing beef or whatever, she'll substitute different wild, wild game. game. But the thing is, with wild game. You really have to be careful not to overcook it. Yes. Because it will dry out, and then you're like, ah, what is this? It's not good. Yeah. You know what? Like your tenderloins, look up the 500-degree method. I don't uh, know what that is. So, like, you do six minutes per pound at 500 degrees in the oven, and then you turn the oven off, and you let it sit for an hour. So, like, on my uh, tenderloins, I'll bacon wrap them, and you do six minutes per pound for... How if it's a two pound tenderloin, you do 12 minutes at 500 degrees. Turn off the oven, let it sit for an hour, and when you take it out of the oven, they will be perfectly medium rare, bloody, red, and not dry and amazing. Like, that is the only way to cook backstraps and tenderloins, in my opinion. Any any big game? Well, yeah, I mean, backstraps, tenderloins, that 500 degree method, you know, you don't want to overcook them. It's so easy to do. You can smoke them on the barbecue. I just find that I have a little more control in the oven. Okay. Um, And that... That's been like our go-to method for those. Nice, yeah. Brittany loves doing our uh, like our simple not think about it is she will stuff garlic cloves into the meat. Oh yeah. And then she has whatever like salt, just basic salt and pepper, um, and she'll do that. And it's just that's like the simplest. Everybody knows that yeah. you know that cooking method. But then sometimes I'll come home and the kitchen's just. Ingredients Destroyed. everywhere. Destroyed. I, 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 can't, I can't say that, but you get what we're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's ingredients everywhere, and then all of a sudden, this l- little dish of heaven comes out, and it's like. Perfect. My husband eats things I don't eat, though. Like, I really like kidneys. Have you ever eaten kidneys? No. Kidneys are delicious. Really? The texture is normal, and the flavor is normal. Um, kidneys are very good, so don't hesitate to harvest your kidneys and okay. try them. I don't care for liver, and I don't care for heart so much. Heart flavor is okay. The texture freaks me okay. out. So I'll eat heart. I don't like liver. Yeah, I don't like liver. My husband eats it, though, and I'm, oh, it's not good. But kidneys are pretty good. You should try the kidneys. Okay. Just give an experience. They look like little beans. Interesting. Like, literally, kidney beans, they look like kidneys. Okay, so we have this big debate with a couple of our friends over at Hornaday. What do you like better, elk? Or antelope? Elk. That's what we say. 100%. And they're like, antelope's way better all day long. I'm like... Depends on what they're eating. I'm like... Yeah. And they have lanolin in their hair. So if you're not careful with how you... And their hair just spats out, right? Yeah. When you cut them, they're like... Right. Um, the lanolin in their hair can taint the meat as well. I didn't know that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So you got to be careful with... Like, I cut as little as I have to on an antelope. As little cuts. Because as soon as you cut the hide... The hair spews everywhere, and so I really try to keep the hair off the meat, keep it, you know, keep it right. cool as fast as you can. But it depends, I think, ultimately on what they're eating. Also, I, I think that's a big difference too, because I've had, I've never harvested a bear. It's yeah. kind of, it's one of my uh, my dream animals to yeah. hunt. Yeah. Um, Brittany's kind of like it's a teddy bear. I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's different. No. But 
I had um, bear from Idaho, yeah. and they cooked it as a burger. Yeah. And it tasted like blueberries. And yeah. I was like, what the hell? Yeah, because right? they it eat was, a lot of berries. Yeah, They're it was so meat. delicious. Yeah. And then I've had bear from Arizona, and it tasted just like a regular sausage yeah. type of meat, right? Um, so it really does depend on where you get the meat eat, from. Yeah. And with bears, I typically just make sausage out of mine. But it also depends. Like for me, I've harvested bears and they have worms. And I, I just can't do it. I won't yeah. eat them. If well, I see worms in their meat, I'm out. I'm done. I'm not. It's not. <laughs> no. Not happening. With bears, you have to be really careful. Like that yummy medium rare meat that we all love, it's not safe to consume that way because right. they can't have trichinosis. Why well, heard something you, like most bears have trichinosis now. They often do. You can have your meat tested and then you'll know, can I safely consume this at a, at a medium rare temperature? Otherwise, I just tell everybody just make some type of sauce. So- like I do bratwurst. Okay. Um, so bratwurst or cheddar sausages and then... I'll cook them and then divvy them up with different mustards, types of mustards. Like I'll get nice. stone ground mustards or different mustards and I'll serve them as like an appetizer. And people don't know so what they're eating. So you do like eating. a little charcuterie board, meat yeah, board yeah, yeah, or whatever? Yeah, yeah, with, with, with bear and then, you know, have it processed several ways. And, and same thing with wild pigs, though. You have to have the meat cooked all the way. Um, in Europe, they're mandated to have it tested for trichinosis. Oh, wow. So okay. in Sweden, like when we harvest a pig, we cut off a chunk of meat and we send it in and they test it and then they say, okay, it's safe. Then we consume it. But um, gotcha. any presence of worms for me and I'm out on the bear thing. You know, I'm I'm right there with you. Yeah. If, if it looks or I think that there's anything wrong yeah. with the meat, it's just better better not to. Hey everyone, after successfully using Rack One Big Game Peanut Butter and their super yummy PB&J in my spring bear baits, I'm really excited to share with you guys two new premium bear attractants from Rack One. One is Picnic Basket and the other one is Jelly Donut Flavors. Like every good Picnic Basket, this tantalizing blend contains a variety of irresistible snacks and treats to whet the appetite of any and all bears that come within range of its powerful, alluring aroma. The carefully blended mix of fruits and nuts and other secret ingredients put out a picnic spread and long distance scent trail that'll have the big fellows inviting themselves over to a party. I think it's safe to say that we all love donuts and that bears will also love to wake up to a yummy donut. Rack One's Jelly Donut is an aromatic mix of fruits and nuts blended with Rack One's secret ingredients formulated to lure bears in where you want them. The aroma is intense and nose catching even at long distance and will send the snack signal far downwind. All the Rack One flavors are sure to lure them in and can be placed wisely near trail cameras or your hunting stand. The rest is easy. All you have to do is make the shot. So what's your favorite dish? Oh, oh boy. My favorite like meat dish. Meat dish so yeah. pretty much every night Yogi well, I mean, and- Yogi's your favorite dish, <laughs> your favorite food, your favorite food dish. Whoa, <laughs> we just went there. <laughs> And we're back. <laughs> <laughs> Yogi's blushing. He has to leave now. Um, so pretty much every night, I I love elk steaks, but I don't love elk steaks because it's so easy to overcook them. Yes. So when I eat an elk steak or a deer steak, I really like like the chicken fried version where it's like breaded <laughs> okay. and cooked in oil and it's like not healthy. So right. what we typically do like pretty much every night is we eat ground meat patties. So okay. we just season the meat and then we pan fry them with raw onion and a little bit of cheese. And that's kind of our go-to at night because we're home so infrequently, it's really hard for me to become like creative with my cooking. Right. So we'll be home two nights and we're gone or we're home three nights and gone. And so... I love cooking chilies and stews. I mean, when I was in my high school, I had a catering company. Oh, so really? Wow. I love cooking, but we just anymore, like out of convenience, I just don't have time for all of this like recipe preparation right. to get as creative as I'd like. So we get pretty in the habit of just eating the meat patty. So that, I mean, I totally get that. And that's one of our biggest 
problems. I mean, you see, you know, when I'm cooking, it's usually during the off yeah. match season that we're cooking. Yeah. Um, Brittany wants to start incorporating cooking into the match shows. Oh, you should. Right. So, like, when we go to, like, Arbuckle, yeah. the big thing up there is pig hunts. Yeah. So, she wants to incorporate a pig recipe into the show to show people, you know, hey, this is yeah. the area. You can even do pig burgers. I've like, when I was burger. in Sweden, um, we we shot a pig with a guy um, that Yogi's really good friends with, Magnus. He let us hunt. And the, the sow that I harvested, they actually take the, the meat, they grind it into burgers and then they sell that burger meat and that's their hunt budget for the year like they came to the u.s this year and did some hunting with us but pig burgers are really good like you don't have to just have it into like breakfast sausage or anything like that like burger the actual burgers are super yummy interesting or you could have it made into broths and stuff too it's just cheaper if you just make it into grind and then make patties and we do so our first our first big game animal I had processed. Mm-hmm. After that, um, we had the access deer processed because we did that in Hawaii. Yeah, it was but, the same with us, yeah. Yeah, but everything after that, we process ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we bought the big old grinders and the stuffers. Two and, and a half horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, so that's actually become a huge, like, bonding, mm-hmm. sharing experience with the wife because mm-hmm. she's usually, like, shoving the meat in there and pushing it down and I'm trying to package it or vice versa yeah. or whatever. And Yeah, and it's it's, it's very fun. rewarding to go through that full process. And every time you open a package, your hands have been on that. And from harvest to table, you have be the only person that's touched that meat. Right. It, it makes it a very special process. I think it does too. And I, you know, actually, so I do have one question for you. I know we're almost, you know, at that time limit, but we have... We can talk all day, technically. I mean... I'm here. We're kind of we're kind of the boss of ourselves here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here, so let's do it. Um, a lot of friends and family, because I am the first hunter yeah. in our family, aren't familiar with with big game, and they actually mm-hmm. have a. They, I don't know what that would be. They're kind of standoffish, I guess, from trying it. How do you suggest, or how do you get people that have never had wild game? How do you get them to try it for the first time? You have just you ever feed had it to them. I don't know. If you come to my house, you're probably going to eat it whether you want to or not. <laughs> um, I just feed it to people. But I really haven't had a lot of um, uh, hesitation from folks to try wild game. And, and I'm, I try to really approach life with, hey, try something once. If it's not for you, don't do it again. Right. Um, and I've tried some really weird stuff with my husband in other countries with food that I'm like, okay, try it. It's not for me. Um, you know, in organs and, you know, heck, I ate fish eyeballs one time. And oh, fish eyes are good. You like fish eyes? They're so good. Really? They pop in your mouth. Uh, the little yeah. gelatin. Like a little salty. Yeah. It's like a giant fish you, egg, but bleh, yeah. yeah, with the we used lens to in it. Go I to the fishing lot, you know, off the boat and Yeah, and you eat, eat the eyeballs. Yeah. Okay. I, I am Japanese. Well, you'll eat anything, in other <laughs> words. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I really I haven't had a lot of aversion for people trying wild game. A lot of people will be like, oh, I don't like it. It's gamey. And, and that's okay, you know. But right. I, chimichurri sauce can make anything pretty much taste good. This is true. Yeah. This is true. Especially is, homemade chimichurri. Oh, Brittany does that all the dude, time. I love chimichurri. Oh, like, yeah. we do we do a lot of bacon wrapped meat in, with a chimichurri on it. It's freaking bomb. Nice. Like, Cabela's came out with a. A chimchurri, it's like in flakes, and you just add a little bit of white vinegar, uh, white wine vinegar, and o- olive oil. Right. And it's already pre seasoned, and you just stir it up, and it's so easy. And it's good on potatoes, it's good on the meat. Chimchurri's good on anything. Chimchurri's good on anything. And so, like, that's one, you know, for. For that barrier, like if you have somebody that's hesitant to try it, if you prepare it in a manner and then pair it with something like a chimichurri, um, man, it makes everything taste good. Right. It's all preparation. It is. Yeah. It you is. fry anything in oil, it's probably going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. Right. Fried Twinkies. Yeah. And fried Snickers and yeah. fried, yeah, anything. Well, and like wild good. turkey, that's one of the hardest animals I feel like to prepare and have it be tasty. So I've never had wild turkey. It's not anything like your butterball. Um, but one a wilderness athlete did a cookbook, and one of the recipes that they had had cranberries and rosemary and a balsamic glaze. Okay. And the balsamic and the cranberries and the rosemary, it was so good. Like, I made it for my parents one night, and I was like, okay, you know, you guys, I don't know. And it was amazing. Like, it was good enough that it would qualify for Thanksgiving. Wow. Like, and, and the balsamic mm. just cuts through some of that that flavor and I and I really feel like with some wild game you need to have an agent like soaking it in buttermilk overnight right. and there's all kinds of like old like 
tried and true things to kind of eliminate some of that gaminess. Um, and, and balsamic is a great way to do it. Chimchurri with the vinegar is a great way to do it. So and I've it heard just of changes the texture and everything. Italian salad dressing. Same thing, same, same concept. Thing, right? yeah, yeah, I've never done it. Italian but, salad dressing with turkey, um, like marinating it and that, and then you can grill it. Um, mm -hmm. But your marinade on the wild turkey, in my opinion, is really important. How you, how you prepare gotcha. it, what you put with it is really important. So Nice. Yeah, no, I love cooking. I love eating, more importantly. So I, I'm getting um, hungry now. All I these. Know, I, well, all we had this morning was a yogurt, so we're, like, starving. Like, it's time <laughs> to go. All this food talk's making you crazy. No, Brit Brittany woke me up at earlier at 5. She's off room service. Well, I, I like, travel with my own Cholula. Do you? Oh, I do. Uh oh. Even when I'm hunting, I got like a jumbo sized Cholula in my backpack. <laughs> yeah, I'm lifelong See, committed. You're, you're brave. If I had Cholula out in the field, I'd, uh, yeah, you it would be it. good. You drink it. It would not be good for me. No, you don't like Cholula? I, I, any spices. You can't eat it. I eat spices at home because it's I'm safe. safe. <laughs> <laughs> we I'm both just, said the same one yeah. at the same time. <laughs> right. You're so safe. I'm safe. <laughs> you know, I, so it's not a matter of, of like. It's yeah, a yeah, matter yeah. of my stomach not doing well Yeah, with yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I got so, you. Yeah, that's so funny. You're like, ah, I got to be in a safe zone if I'm going to eat that. Yeah. yeah other, well, I love spicy food. And that's, that's another thing. Like, man, I love taking wild game with green chilies and, like, roasted green chilies and a little cream cheese and some bacon and you wrap oh, like it all poppers. up in a little roll and you make it like a meat popper. Oh, oh. so good. Yeah. Like green chilies. But is, I can't eat them if they're too hot, though. Right. Like if, they, if they're if they making me sweat out my ears, I'm not cool with that. But just that flavor. Mm. Yeah, so we started, like, we live in the city in, in California. So we have these, um, like, hydroponic gardens. Yeah. You know, and we're growing... Um, Marijuana. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was just sorry. That was rude. <laughs> JK. Uh, <laughs> we were growing our own tomatoes and jalapenos. Yeah. And so we'd get these jalapenos and like not one of them were duds. And Brittany loves spicy. Yeah, but they were real spicy. And, yeah. And so I had made jerky. You like touch your eye after you cut them and you're like, ah. Oh, um, yeah, murder. Um, I made this jerky and I made half the batch with jalapenos on yeah. it when I was dehydrating it. And then I made the other half Travis way yeah. without, without the jalapenos. Yeah. And somehow the, the jalapeno stuff touched my regular and even just whatever the cross contamination, the, yeah, happened. whatever cross contamination took place, even my regular stuff yeah. was so spicy. Yeah. I just, yeah, I, I can't do like, it. Like, yeah, little, yeah, take you too much. I love, you, we have a cool exchange program. There's a butcher in Buffalo, Wyoming, and you bring in meat, and they give you pound per pound meat back. You don't know what meat you're getting. It's like mystery <laughs> right. meat, right? But, like, we took a whole mule deer in, and we traded that for meat sticks. And pound for pound, you get, you give them your animal, and then right. they give you meat sticks back. And we did that this year, and... I love them. Like, you have no idea what it is. I mean, it's antelope, it's elk, it's bear. I mean, I don't know. It's right. just meat. Um, and that's been, like, that's our go-to hunting snack. Like, when we're yeah. on the mountain, we don't even bring sandwiches anymore. We just do the meat sticks. No, that's perfect. And, I mean, stuff like that. Trade when, shows. and Yeah, it's perfect. It's convenient. It's healthy. You yeah. know what it is, right? I mean, Well, kind of. I mean, well, it is mystery I mean, meat in that capacity. But, but you know, it's not yeah. full of hormones no. and... and whatever you know it's not processed no. like you know whatever and that's the big thing there's so much hormones in meat anymore you know, being able to harvest your own really to me is is better for your for your body it in is the long run. well i haven't so i eat steaks when i go out yeah. and, you know at this show oh, i'll, I'll sure. go for steaks or whatever but at home we have not bought red meat since 2020 that's insane we have not bought any red meat we buy chicken and we buy yeah. fish but no red meat. I'm not a big chicken eater, so Yogi doesn't have to worry about that. But I love a ribeye. Ooh. Oh, yeah. and, and I'm a sucker for a ribeye. <laughs> you got it. I mean, it's yeah. delicious, right? They're really The fat is amazing. Right. So. Also, you, kidney fat. Have you ever taken the kidney fat off your deer or anything? Oh. Don't throw it away. Kidney fat, you take it and you um, render it down, and then you cook your meat in that grease, and that the little crispy fat chunks are so yummy. Really? <laughs> oh, it's so good. Yeah. Don't let that fat dry out. Like, eat it. One of these days, the four of us, we're going to have to, like, double date hunt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we can just eat. <laughs> and then, yeah, we'll let, you know, we'll let the cooking come yeah. out and try new things. Yeah. 
I've I've never thought to eat kidneys it's or use kidney fat. Yeah, use kidney fat as kidney a. Fat. It's like it looks like little chunks of brain. It's like hard. You're not selling it. <laughs> I know it's not though, but it's like hard nodulely. Like if you if you have a whole deer, don't take the kidney fat off like around your it, like it'll kind of come around the tenderloins and if you take too much fat off you dry out those tenderloins so leave that fat in there but that fat when you take it off um, like my wild sheep I shot in 2018 we ate the fat on the mountain and we rendered it down and then we ate the the little balls of kidney fat they were like crispy oh so good it's almost like beef fat same kind of texture is is suet like beef fat suet and then we use that fat to cook the meat it was delicious you kind of, kind of not selling it. I know, <laughs> I'm like, it's so good. I'm, like, I'm promise I'll, you. I'll, I'll try it yeah, because yeah, I'll yeah. try it. You know, Anything I'll try once. it once. And then if you don't but, like it, don't go back. Yeah, but you know, when you're telling me it looks like balls and it, brains, it, it looks just like <laughs> brains. It looks like brains. It's like little balls of like fat, but they're hard. They're like hard little nodules, and um, I, I, yeah, it kind of looks like brain. I don't know, but it's it's firm <laughs> brain is squishy you know it's like a different texture but brain, i don't like brain i don't eat brain i'm not eating a brain i don't care what anybody says i'm not eating a brain so we were in vegas one time at a street taco place and Brittany has had some street tacos yeah. and i ordered her some brain tacos no well, she I was, was not happy arbuckle with jake and he had me eat tripe tacos yeah <laughs> I'm like okay jake i'm gonna try this and he's like oh yeah tripe is good da, da, da. so we ate intestines yeah yeah Brittany Intestine likes that in, in uh menudo Oh, okay. she, she eat tripe and all that kind of stuff. Vietnamese dishes. Of course, a lot of tripe. yeah. Well, she's not Asian, though. She is. Is she, she Asian? I thought yeah. she was Hispanic. No, she's, well, she is. <laughs> well, she's both. <laughs> she's, well, she's Filipino, which okay. is the Hispanic Asian. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. And um, her dad is uh, um, Scandinavian. I don't okay. know exactly where. Yeah, like he's, he's a Viking. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Swedish then, in that case. Yeah, yeah. Or Swedish, yeah. 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 So, so she's got everything. And yeah. so everybody's like, what are you? I'm like, ah, uh, do we have to, like, identify as anything? Can I just say I'm a human? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm here. I'm American. Yeah. I'm whatever, right? Yeah, it doesn't yeah, really matter. Sure. We get along cool. I went and hunted in South Africa. Yeah. And they, um, a couple of people in our group shot zebras. Mm-hmm. And oh, it's very good. Yeah, they're like, you should yeah. eat the zebra. I'm like, I can't eat a zebra. You know? Mentally, and, you couldn't. And it's my mental hangup. Yeah. And my mental hangup is in, I don't necessarily believe in astrology or anything but i'm a sagittarius and i'm the year of the horse okay right so horses to me are are not sacred animals but they're special animals yeah right that's okay and to me a zebra is a horse yeah you know so i'm like no i can't eat that and then we ended up later on Brittany and i ended up watching a documentary on on how different mongolian tribes hunt and eat and they're eating horses of course in europe you can go to any grocery store and they have an entire section of lunch meat that is horse meat. Really? Like, it's it's very common. And in a lot of countries, like France, if you buy steaks, a lot of times those steaks are horse steaks. Like at a butcher, a local butcher. So it's I, the U.S. is really one of the few countries in the world that does not use horse as a consumptive, like regular everyday meat. Like, literally, grocery stores will have different varieties of horse meat with different percentages of horse in it. And uh, so, I didn't know that. You know, yeah. So do you cook horse meat the same way well, you they, would Well, I don't else? know. I've never cooked horse meat. But when we buy the lunch meat, like Yogi, every time we go over there, he's always buying horse meat for lunch meat because he likes it. You know, What so. is it? Does it taste like bologna? Or, or it's, like a, it it's like a... It's like a... It's very salty. They almost do it huh. like a... Um, what is that? Um, what is that beef that they have? It's really salted, like beef, um, like uh, pastrami-ish. Pastrami? It's very okay. pastrami-ish, yeah. So it's so. seasoned and, and whatnot. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's a darker, redder texture. Yeah. Okay. It's very salty. So w- when I come to Europe, don't tell me what I'm eating. <laughs> no, I don't eat the horse meat. I don't really care for the horse meat. I've tried it, but I didn't I didn't love it. So I'm like, eh, I'm good not eating horse. Yeah. Like when we were in Germany, we went to a, a Christmas market and they had donkey sausages. And they're like, do you want to try the donkey sausage? And I was videoing it. And I'm like, um... I'm, I'm kind of torn between being a donkey owner and a carnivore right now, and I'm going to take a pass on it. But yeah. um, I'm not opposed to eating it. I just, but I'm, See, like, yeah, for me, it's like, just not for me, right? If, if I came over to your guys' house in Europe and it was being served for dinner. You would eat it. I would eat it out of respect and for trying it once. Yeah. 
right? In South Africa, if they would have served it to me without telling me what it you was, would have eaten it. I would have eaten it. Everything they served me in South Africa was, was absolutely delicious. delicious. Yeah. So I would have tried it. Yeah. But if it's on a menu, I'm going to go for something else. A prime rib. I like that way with the else. lamb too. Yeah. I don't like lamb. Oh, I love lamb. <laughs> oh, I love <laughs> lamb. Lamb but chops are. Woo. Do my husband? He makes me try his all the time. Just try it. Just try it. Just and, I, and I'll try it. It's fine. It's just not the flavor where I'm like, oh, I'm going to sit down and eat an entire eight ounces of this. Oh, I, yeah. No, I I love lamb. I love goat. I love you know. And I mean, antelope's goat. We love all the animals. That's why we hunt. That's why we shoot. Yeah. That's why we do what we do, because it's good. It's it's a great, healthy way for you to subsidize, subsidize is that the right word, your meat? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And like I said, I haven't bought red meat since 2020. That's so awesome. I'm so happy about it. I love hearing that, because you're a new hunter and I am. first generation. And when you guys have your baby, you'll... Uh, because we're not having one. They are. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anti <laughs> And We'll get the anti of the uncle. I Anti-double. like that. Yeah, I'm good with that. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Like, this has been an awesome podcast. And yes. I really hope all of you listening and watching get out there. Sign up for an NRL Hunter match. Get online. NRL Hunter. Dot, was it NRL Hunter. Dot org. Yep. Um, and register. If you have questions, hit the contact us button and email Travis and ask him questions until your heart's content and then just show up uh, because you're going to have a lot of fun and you will not regret it, I promise. Yeah, and and when you show up, don't be afraid to say, hey, I'm new, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, so a quick quick statistic before we sign off. Last season, we had 54% new shooters Mm -hmm. at all of our matches. That was the average. Our first match of 2022 or 2023 was in Arizona. We had uh, 63 or 64% new shooters. Mm -hmm. So... The, the new people are the people that we want to attract. Yeah. The people that have been shooting, you know, the PRS and the, the, you know, race gun type of stuff. We absolutely love to have you guys as well. Mm-hmm. You guys typically are more skilled behind your rifles than some of the new guys. And we want to make sure that everybody's going away with some knowledge and able to... Mm-hmm properly and ethically harvest an animal 100 percent. no that's awesome i i really you guys are also on instagram where people find you on instagram instagram uh facebook on all of that what's kind of your stuff. handle though oh uh nrl hunter okay so your nrl hunter on instagram and facebook and then nrlhunter.org online you guys yes. check them out uh travis thank you so much again thank for your you. time and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the wild and uncut podcast recorded here at the hunt expo at the ruger booth thank you guys for tuning in Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.